thank you uh, very much. I want to thank the Faith and Freedom Coalition. I want to thank all of you personally for coming out tonight. Uh, Gopal, I want to thank you and Steve for your great leadership here in Iowa. I want to thank Ralph Reed for what he's done all across the country to build the Faith and Freedom movement. 2012 is the most important election in this country since 1860. Next year we will decide whether the disastrous policies of class warfare, bureaucratic socialism, radical judges, and bureaucrats who treat us as subjects rather than citizens will be continued in office, or whether we will decisively repudiate an 80-year drift to the left, a drift in our newsrooms, a drift in our colleges and universities, a drift in our bureaucracies, a drift with our judges, and a drift among elected politicians. That's how decisive 2012 is. Let me give you one example. The President has announced what will be seen by historians as a decisive defeat for the United States in Iraq. Despite the best effort of our military, which is, I think, tactically the finest military in history, the failure of various civilian institutions, and frankly, the failure to understand the scale of the problem means that we will have lost the third Iraq war. This may or may not be popular to say, but as a historian, I think it needs to be said. We won the first Iraq war in 1991, driving Iraq out of Kuwait in four days. We won the second Iraq war to defeat Saddam Hussein in 23 days. For reasons I frankly don't understand, Ambassador Bremer then changed our mission to radically changing Iraqi society. After eight years, thousands of lives, hundreds of billions of dollars, we will leave in defeat. Don't kid yourself. It is defeat. Iran is stronger. When Maliki, the head of Iraq, goes to Tehran for a conference on terrorism, when he promises Assad that he will help prop him up as dictator of Syria, when they refuse to sign an agreement protecting American forces from Iraqi law. Go down the list. We have lost influence despite many American dead, more American wounded, and hundreds of billions of losses. We need to fundamentally rethink our policy for the entire region. We need to recognize that if Iran is dangerous with one bomb, potentially, then how dangerous is Pakistan with over 100 nuclear weapons? We need to understand how precarious the entire region is. And that's an example of what makes this such an extraordinarily important election. Look, the process of recovery economically is not that difficult. I predict to you that late on election night, as it is election night, as it is clear as it is clear that Obama has been defeated and that the Democratic Senate has been defeated, that late that night, the recovery will begin. People react very quickly to news. Investors will start changing their decisions. Small businesses will start hiring. We can have a dramatically better Christmas in 2012 if it is the goodbye Obama Christmas than we would possibly have if it was a re-elect Obama Christmas. So one of our slogans should be, do you want a great Christmas? Vote against Obama. Now even for many Democrats that will begin to be an appealing idea. Our key symbol is easy. He is the best food stamp president in American history. We want to be the best paycheck president in American history. But President Obama is just a start. While he personifies the move to the left, there is vastly more work to do than beating Barack Obama. One of the first things I will do is send a bill to Congress asking them to, uh, to fire Bernanke, 
immediately so we can replace him. I will insist that the Fed be audited and I will insist that all of the decision documents for the last three years be published so all of us can know who got our money and why and who didn't get our money and why. And I believe we will be shocked and sobered to learn how out of control the Federal Reserve has been. And when we replace Bernanke, which I would hope we could do within the first 30 days, it will be with somebody who is committed to a sound dollar. We should go back to the principle of a dollar as good as gold, so that when you save it, it's going to be worth a dollar your entire lifetime and not be eroded by academic theoreticians who think they're smarter than the market and smarter than the American people. You can see a great deal of what we're outlining, if you go to newt.org and you look at the 21st century contract with America, which is a fairly elaborate and comprehensive document which will continue to grow and evolve until we issue the final legislative version on September 27, 2012, and the final executive orders version on October 1st, so that everybody will know going into the final week of the campaign what this is all about. On executive orders, let me just say the very first one, which will be signed about 4 o'clock in the afternoon on the day I'm sworn in as president, about two hours after the inaugural address ends, about the time that the Obama family arrives at Andrews Air Force Base to go back to Chicago. Uh, the, the very first executive order will eliminate all of the White House czars as of that moment. The second executive order will reinstate Ronald Reagan's Mexico City policy that no U.S. money is spent for abortion anywhere in the world. The third executive order will reinstate President George W. Bush's conscience policy which says no doctor, no pharmacist, no nurse, no hospital can be compelled to perform any activity against their religious beliefs. And the fourth executive order will order the State Department as of that day to open the United States Embassy in Jerusalem and recognize the sovereignty of the State of Israel. The fact is we're going to develop more executive orders over the next year. Uh, you can go to newt.org and participate. We're asking for advice and counsel. All of the executive orders will be written and laid out in an orderly form so people know what they are. And in the last month of the campaign, if the president says he's for something, we'll be able to print it out and ask, give him a chance to sign it right then and there uh, so we can find out whether or not he really meant it. There are a lot of things I'd like to get into over time. The Environmental Solutions Agency should replace the EPA. All you have to do is imagine the bureaucrat who rides on Metro to get to an air-conditioned high-rise office building to sit in the middle of Washington imagining dust, and then writes a dust regulation based on zero understanding of farming and zero understanding of America beyond the Beltway, and you know why we should replace the EPA. I would immediately move to defund Planned Parenthood and take that money and devote it to adoption services to create an alternative to abortion. I always tell people I don't ask you to be for me because if you're for me you'll vote, go home and say I hope Newt gets it done. I ask people to be with me because I think the scale of change we need is going to take eight hard, difficult years. And in that process, there is going to be a lot of counter-reaction from the left, a lot of fighting from special interest. It can only happen if the American people are with us. And frankly, if we're going to shrink government in Washington, we need to grow citizenship back home. So we return power to people. The last thing I want to say is, because this is the most historic election since 1860, because the issues are so complex and fundamental, as your nominee, 
I will challenge President Barack Obama to seven Lincoln-Douglas style debates, three hours each with a timekeeper but no moderator. And to be fair, I would agree that he can use a teleprompter. <laughs> After all, if you had to spend an entire three-hour debate defending Obamacare, wouldn't you want to have the help of a teleprompter? <laughs> I believe that, in fact, he'll in the end agree to it. I think they will be as historic and as decisive as the original debates in 1858. And I think, the, I think he owes it to the country not to hide behind a billion dollars extorted by a White House incumbent, not to try to smear and destroy his opponent, but to stand face to face so the American people have a genuine opportunity to hear both sides. And I can assure you, as your nominee, I think I will be able to represent American exceptionalism, free enterprise, private property rights, and the Constitution better than he can represent class warfare, bureaucratic socialism, weakness in foreign policy, and total confusion in the economy. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What is your comprehensive plan to shape your future administration's energy policy? And please include how this vision differs from the approach of the current administration. You know, I've heard you ask that several times tonight. And <laughs> my first thought when you say, tell us how it would differ from the current administration, is you've got to be kidding. This is the most anti-American energy administration in history. It is just unbelievable. So start with that, okay? This is a president who goes to Brazil and says to the Brazilians, I'm really glad you're drilling offshore. And I'd like us to be your best customer, which I thought was a sign he headed exactly backwards. The job of the American president is not to be a purchasing agent for foreign countries. It's to be a salesman for the United States of America. A friend of mine said the only way to develop Alaska is to sell it to the Brazilians, and then Obama will think it's terrific. Uh, if you go to newt.org and the 21st century contract with America, we outline an energy plan. It's pretty straightforward. Look, Michelle Bachman had it right. We have more energy than any other country in the world. We take all of our energy. 20% of your electricity here comes from wind, which is, makes it second only to Denmark as a producer of wind. Uh, I've always been a supporter of ethanol. I even supported ethanol, it was called gasohol in 1984. Uh, and I did it for a practical reason. If my choice is for the next dollar to go to Iran or to go to Iowa, I pick Iowa. If the next dollar is to go to Saudi Arabia or go to South Dakota, I pick South Dakota. And if you look at the growing efficiencies of corn production and the growing efficiencies of ethanol production, it has been a 25-year success story of greater and greater productivity, which has kept money here at home, enriched rural communities, created a much better environment for the United States. And the fact is we need to develop more and better science in biofuel not cut them off. And I just want to say one thing about... I don't think I want to pick a fight with any of my good friends who are running. But I get a little weary of people who represent oil, which has consistently had tax subsidies for its entire history, explaining that they, they're really not sure about these subsidies. Notice it's always these subsidies. It's never the ones down there. I noticed that when Senator Coburn introduced a bill which was anti-ethanol, he didn't include subsidies for gas and oil, because as an Oklahoman, that would have been suicidal. So I just think we ought to have a fair, fair playing field. I would extend and make permanent any kind of credit for things like, like wind or solar, so there's a capital investment ratio. 
I mean, I mean rationale. I would also continue to develop flex fuel vehicles, which is really the next stage of ethanol isn't a subsidy for ethanol. It's getting to flex fuel tanks and getting to flex fuel vehicles so that everybody in America can make a consumer choice. Because the truth is, when oil reaches a certain price, ethanol is cheaper, not more expensive. But you have to have vehicles that can use it and gas stations that have it. So there are steps we can take there. But I'm also for oil and gas. I mean, it is crazy for us to have an area in the Chukchi Sea. This is not Anwar. The Chukchi Sea off Alaska has as much oil and gas as the Gulf of Mexico. And our current litigation policies allow all sorts of left-wing environmental groups to stop. Shell Oil gave up $3 billion and quit. So I would go through every single stage, and I have a very simple model. Keep the $500 billion a year in energy that goes overseas here at home. It's better for the economy. It's better for American jobs. It's better for national security. And it makes it much easier for us to then deal with dictators overseas the way we should deal with them without any concern about economic reprisal. I'm trying to be consistent. What? You're doing good. I'm not. I didn't mean. I wasn't trying to attack you. All right. I mean, if you're you, not some news guy. It, no. If you could reverse one energy-related policy decision from the last three years, what would it be, and what would you have done differently? I think you've already said something. Actually, I think the biggest ones are personnel. You ought to have an, a department of. If you're going to have a secretary, a department of energy, which I wouldn't. But if you were going to have one, you ought to have a secretary who's pro-American energy. We don't. The current secretary is anti-American energy. He favors some fantasy that made perfect sense at Berkeley in a classroom and makes no sense in the real world. Okay. By the way, I would also have a, a secretary of interior who favored American solutions as opposed to the current secretary who's done everything he could to stop any production anywhere in the country. Speaker, we're certainly uh, gratified that you're here tonight. Uh, my first question is, what would you specifically do to prevent abortion on demand and defend traditional marriage? I just released a fairly lengthy paper, which you can find at newt.org, which takes up uh, item 9 in the proposed 21st century contract and outlines the framework for bring, bringing balance back to the judiciary. Most of our major crises in our culture are driven by radical judges who violate the American Constitution, violate American history, and are doing things that are fundamentally destructive. And for 40 years, conservatives have said, well, I will appoint better judges. Uh, after the 2002 Ninth Circuit Court decision that one nation under God and the Pledge of Allegiance was unconstitutional, I, be I got really intrigued. I wrote a book called Rediscovering God in America, and Cliss and I made a movie about it. We then wrote a series of other books, every one of which has chapters on the judiciary. I taught a short course at the University of Georgia Law School, and the paper we just released represents nine years of thinking about this. The courts were third. Read the Constitution. First comes the legislative branch, which is supposed to be closest to people. Second comes the executive branch, to execute the law passed by the legislative branch. Third and least important of the three is the judiciary. The Federalist Papers. Alexander Hamilton says, the judiciary will never pick a fight with the two elected branches because it would inevitably lose it. The Warren Court in 1958 asserts outrageously that the Supreme Court is supreme over the other two branches. Now, it's always been a Supreme Court within the judicial branch. But we were told that Montesquieu's theory of balance meant each of the three branches balanced the other two. Jefferson, when asked about judicial supremacy, said, that is an absurdity. It would be an oligarchy. Lincoln, in his first inaugural, says of the Dred Scott decision by the Supreme Court, and you could argue the Supreme Court's bad decision led directly to the Civil War. And, and, and Lincoln, because they said slavery existed everywhere in the country and you couldn't do anything about it. And Lincoln says in his first inaugural, to believe that nine people could dictate to the entire nation the meaning of the Constitution would be the end of our liberties. Now, there are four practical consequences of this. Consequence number one is presidents on occasion ignore the court. Jackson thought the, court, the United States Bank was unconstitutional. He was told the Supreme Court thought it was constitutional. He said, that's fine. 
In the judicial branch, they can believe that. In the executive branch, I believe this. We both swear to uphold the Constitution. We're co-equals in interpreting it. And he promptly ignored them. And that's doable. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, upon capturing 14 German saboteurs, explained they would be tried and they would be executed. And he did not, would not accept a writ of habeas corpus from the Supreme Court, and he sent his attorney general over to say, don't, don't issue it. I'm commander-in-chief for the middle of a war. And they didn't. As president, I would say that I would instruct the national security apparatus to ignore the three most recent Supreme Court decisions on terrorism, and I would say those are null and void and have no binding effect on the United States, and as commander-in-chief, I will not tolerate a federal judge risking the safety of the United States with some misguided interpretation. The second thing you can do is the, co the Congress can clearly use its power to define rights of appeal. The Congress could have said, for example, and if we'd been clever, we probably would have written into Defense of Marriage Act, that it was not appealable. This has been done before. It was done by Jefferson and the Judicial Reform Act of 1802. The third option that you have, and one which Robbie George at Princeton has been studying and which I'm intrigued with, is to take the 14th Amendment which says the Congress shall define personhood and pass a law which says personhood in the United States is defined as beginning at conception. And go straight at the court. The last thing you can do is, is a bit stronger. In 1802, Jefferson, and I remind folks, Jefferson's Secretary of State was James Madison, so you have to assume Jefferson and Madison had some knowledge of the Constitution. <laughs> In 1802, they passed the Judicial Reform Act of 1802, which uh, abolishes 18 out of 35 federal judges. Over half of all the federal judges are just, they're not impeached, they're abolished. Court's gone, no salary, go home, it's over. Now, I am not as bold as Jefferson. I would recommend, I mean this very seriously, Judge Beery in San, in San Antonio on June 1st issued a decree that not only could students not pray at their graduation, they couldn't use the word benediction, they couldn't use the word invocation, they couldn't use the word God, they couldn't use the word prayer, they couldn't ask the audience to stand, and if they violated his order, he would arrest and imprison the superintendent. Judge Beery's court should be abolished now. We do not have to tolerate radical anti-American judges rewriting the American Constitution and pretending that we are helpless and candidly once we have abolished this court we should serve notice to the Ninth Circuit that they are on sufferance and if they decide to continue being radical they will become unemployed. Mr. Speaker, what would you do to restore fiscal responsibility and promote the creation of jobs in the United States? Well, they actually are very tightly linked. The only way you get to a balanced budget is with a full employment economy. And here I don't have to offer you a theory. When I became Speaker, we passed working with a liberal Democrat in the White House. So imagine how much more fun it will be to have a Republican Senate, a Republican House, and a Republican President who actually all are working in the same direction. But even with Clinton in the White House, we passed the first major entitlement reform, welfare. Two out of three people went to work or went to school. We reformed Medicare and saved it for more than a decade financially. We passed the first tax cut in 16 years, the largest capital gains tax cut in American history. As a result, unemployment went down from 5.6 to 4.2 percent. When you take people off of Medicaid, off of welfare, off of food stamps, off of unemployment, and they're, back, they're taking care of their family and paying taxes, you reduce spending, you increase revenues the right way, which is with full employment. To give you a sense of scale, when I became Speaker in 1995, the Congressional Budget Office projected over the next 10 years $2,700,000,000 trillion billion in deficits. When I left office four years later, the Congressional Budget Office projected $2,200,000,000 in surplus. 
That is a that is a four point nine trillion dollar swing in four years. Control spending, apply the principles of strong America now to fundamentally overhaul the entire working of the federal government to save five hundred billion dollars a year. Use the Tenth Amendment to return power to the states, block grant Medicaid and save seven hundred billion dollars in a decade. Go through a process of fundamental change on things like unemployment by applying a training requirement. If you need the money, you have to sign up for training to get any money. We're not paying people to do nothing for 99 weeks. <laughs> review, review every aspect of the federal government and start abolishing or shrinking departments, starting by abolishing the Department of Energy, which has been for 30 years the anti-energy department. Finally, I would say to all of you, if you have the right approach, if you pass the right tax cuts, if you repeal the Dodd-Frank bill, which is killing small banks, killing small business, killing housing, if you repeal Sarbanes-Oxley, if you modernize the Food and Drug Administration so its job is to help science get to the patient, if you replace the EPA with an Environmental Solutions Agency, and if you praise and favor and like people who create jobs and get rid of class warfare at every level, you will be astonished how much we will get done, how rapidly people will go to back to work. And I'll just close with this example. In September of 1983, and I was part of all this, I helped in the 1980 campaign, I was serving as a member of the House during this period. In September of 1983, because Reagan cut taxes, deregulated, strengthened American energy, and praised job creators. We added in one month a million one hundred thousand jobs. It's doable. We can do it. It's not magic, but it does take courage, the right principles, and it takes you to be with me, not just for me, because all of us are going to have to make it happen. Thank you. Good luck and God bless you.